I've known you a long time, and I thought I knew almost everything about you. Almost. And I was wrong. I did not know a lot of things about your childhood and how you grew up. Right. And I'm wondering, like, how you survived a lot of that. Uh, I really don't remember some of my childhood. I think a lot of people remind me of some of the things I've done when I was when I was young. But not that many people. You know, I really don't talk to my mother that much. Obviously, right. I mean, you probably see the documentary. You know, my sisters, I don't talk to them as much. But uh, if anything, I had to has to do with my uh, childhood. I really don't know too much about it because it just went, came, and went. But sometimes there's damage that comes from that period of your life, right? That you carry with you, all of us. Well, it's, just, it's difficult because when you live in a, in a situation like that, like most athletes in the 60s, mm -hmm. um, most kids in the 60s and early 70s, you really don't have any direction, even any avenues to, uh, to explore. Right. You know, because your mindset is more like what you do in your surroundings. And living in a project in the ghetto, it's more like you, uh, for fun, you pretty much go and kick rocks, play jacks, play hopscotch with rocks. Uh, anything that has to do with dirt or rocks, we had to play with because we had no toys and stuff like that. I think a lot of people will see this interview and say, I relate to that, <laughs> you know, because that was like, that was our outlet, our outlet to, uh, to enjoy something that, that's, you know, that was fun. But, uh, but if you take t yesteryear, the 60s to now, it's just a whole different, I mean, who would imagine that a person like me or anyone that's in the sports figures that lived in, in the 60s become this from the 60s to this? No one. I didn't think I would, I thought, I thought I would be in jail, or I think I'd be a drug dealer, or be dead. That was my options. There was no option to go play video games. There was no option to go work at a Jack in the Box McDonald's. There was no option back then for anyone. So basically, our outlet was to rob and steal or be a drug dealer. So I, I just, there was no mindset for me to, to try to think of any other way to get out. But you did, you, you did get out. Well, it was, it was, it was different though. It, it was, was difficult to get out under, under the circumstances. So one of the things I didn't know was, um, I knew when you were young that your dad wasn't around. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that was, that's, I don't even, I can't recall anything about him or whoever he is. I saw him one time in my life. What that was that was, one time? That one time was in the Philippines, I think, four years ago. That's the first time I saw him. Well, not only that's the second time I saw him. I saw him in Chicago in 1997. Uh, we was playing, I think, the uh, Utah Jazz. And uh, I was going to practice. I was going to practice at the Berto Center. And I was late, me late. And I was going in to get into the uh, gate, and this black guy runs up to my truck. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, and trying to talk to him. He said, I need to talk to you, I need to talk to you. I said, dude, I'm late for practice. And he said, uh, I just want to let you know that uh, I'm your father. I mean, just out the blue. <laughs> out the blue, and I'm like, oh, come on, I got to deal with this, this stuff today. I couldn't even focus. I said, you know what, dude, I'm late for practice. I'll talk to you later. I think it's just a, just a, a fan coming to me, trying to reach, reach, reach to me. And uh, I go to practice. I don't even think about it. When I went to practice, I didn't even think about it. I said, oh, whatever. So I come out of practice. I get back in my truck. And this guy runs back to my truck and says, I'm your father. You know, and I said, I don't care, man. Whatever, whatever you think. So we, we go to the, we go, I go home. Then we get ready for the game, for the, uh, tonight, uh, the nice game. We get to the game. I go. We're playing a team, so we go and playing a the game. Then all of a sudden, they call, they call a timeout. I'm walking back to the bench, and I happen to look up, and I said, "Wait a minute, what's going on up there?" He said, "Dude, that's your that's your father up there." And I said, "Who? Your father? My dad?" I'm like, "All right, whatever." He said, "No, he just up, up there signing autographs and doing interviews." And I'm like, "All right, great." I'm still thinking it's like it's like a host, and. Uh, and I'm like, all right, great. So when, when the game was over, I went back to the locker room and the reporter said that, uh, did you know your father was here? I said, nope. Did you know that he wrote a book about you? I said, nope. Did you know it was a bestseller? I said, nope. And I'm like, still like, I think it's still a, a big joke because this guy came out of blue and said that he's my father. And I'm like, I've never seen this guy before. 
and um, but uh, it, it was. Uh, but how does that make you feel? This guy that was never there for you, now you're a multi-million dollar athlete and he's signing autographs and writing books? Writing books, yeah. I think that, I think you, if you get in depth with uh, his story, I think he has like uh, 16 wives. He has 16 wives, I think 49 kids, and I was the first one. Supposedly I was the first one. And uh, I didn't know that until someone told me. And, um, and it is funny though how this parallels in my life. You know, it's growing up. You know, if we get to it, if we get in depth with this, and it's, you know, if we if we going around the board with my my my, my, uh, my upbringing, but uh, it's it's a trip that you know that this guy is coming to say he's my father. I've never seen this man, and he's saying that you know I just want to say hello to you. I'm like, whatever. You know, so I'm so used to not having a father after 30 some years, 37 years. You know. It's a little late. It's a little late, right? <laughs> so, the thing about this documentary that really struck me was, you just wanted someone to like you, right? <laughs> it's so funny that you said it, Jackie. Every interview I did yesterday, and it's like that's the only thing that hurts me. That's the only thing that anyone can say about me. Yeah. I can't even do this interview. I can't even do this interview. I even get emotional. I understand. I think that's the only thing people gonna get out this uh, this uh, documentary. I think that um that they they look they're gonna look at me and say, "Wow, all he wants is to be loved. He didn't want no money. He didn't want no fame. He didn't want anything. He just wants somebody to." care about them and stuff like that. I haven't seen the documentary, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And uh, because that's my whole life story is about the fact that, you know, I'm more like didn't have a father, didn't have, really have a mother. She wasn't really attentive to us like that and never said, you know, she, that she loved us and anything like that. And I think a lot of people in the world that, that lived in those, in those, in those, in that period of time, you understand what I'm talking about. It's very difficult when you have a mother, I mean, that work three, four jobs, and you never see her, and all you do is um, get yelled at, and never have anyone to hug you. So this documentary, doc, this documentary is going to show, I guess, the fact that, I guess, the pains and trials and tribulations I went through, just trying to grow up and try to just be uh, involved in, in society, it's, it's, it's evident if you look at this, this documentary. And, and like I said, I never played the game, I never played the sport for money. And I say that a lot in this documentary. I never played for money. I played for because I wanted to play. I loved it. I loved it. And uh, it just gave me an outlet as far as like, and I looked at the fact that I'm, I, I'm not living in projects. I'm not dead. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not this, I'm not that. I don't have a bunch of kids. And I said, I said, somebody had their hands on my shoulder as growing up because I could have went the wrong direction and be something that's, that no one cared about. But for some reason, I think I have a purpose to be here. I mean, literally, a purpose to be here. What do you think that purpose is? I really haven't figured that out. I think that, you know, I've fought a lot of demons um, as being an athlete. Um, one is alcohol. That's, that's what they, everyone knows that. So um, the other one is more like, you know, the shell you see in public is different from the shell you see in private. You know, I always try to tell myself and try to remind myself why I'm still here and why I'm, I need to be here. And, and something I, I contradict myself a lot because I show a good light in public and I show a bad person in, in a behind closed door. And people look at me as this great athlete, this great individual that does all these great things around the world. But this other part of the spectrum, this other guy is, is totally different. You know, it's more like I lie to myself a lot about, uh, I'm a great dad, I love my kids, I love this, I do that, I do that. And then I have to go home to myself and sit there and beat myself up because I'm just, just telling myself all these lies and I go out in public and sit there and say, okay, great, I'm this persona that I'm not. And a lot of people are gonna see this in a documentary, you know, and 
And I think that people would look at me and say, I'm probably one of the few out there on the planet that actually come on TV and just spread his whole heart and just on his sleeve. And I just say it the way it is. And people actually like me for that. And I they think do. that's a refreshing for me to do this to the world and say, hey, what you see is what you get. But you know, we all have demons. We all have uh, things we have to handle and, and, and take care of. But I think the only demon I really have these days that I pretty much have cleared up a lot of these things up in my life I think the only major, major demon I have right now is trying to convince myself that I, that I'm a good dad. That's the worst one right now for me. So what are you doing to make sure you're a good dad? Yeah, man, <laughs> it's, it's hard for me, for some reason, it's very hard for me to try to, to, to break out of that, that cycle. And, and Do you quit. feel like it's too late? Is that what you're feeling? I just think it's just one of those things where I never had any one to ever do that for me. And I, I think sometimes, why am I doing it for somebody else? And, I'm, and knowing the fact that that's my child, that's my wife, or that's my mother, or that's my sister, and it's like, it's hard for me to just gravitate to people like that that's close to me. And uh, it's, it's difficult, even though inside I love them. And, and it hurts me when my kids say, it's okay, Dad, you can hug us, you can touch us. And it's hard because it, 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 it just burns me up. It hurts me so much. And I have to go home and try to reevaluate and just and try to cleanse my soul and say, yes, you can do this. You can do this. You can do this. And you I, can, though. You I, can. Just, I just say, you can do this. And I'm like, oh, my God. you know. And I, I say, okay, I'm going to go do this. And last night, last night my daughter uh, called me. Called me last night. She called me last night. She said, uh... My wife said, um, you, 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 know, you, you know, I can do this. You can do it. Take your time. Just take your time. You know, this, this is what I get beat up so much about to my, for myself. She said, Dennis, you know, I don't want anything from you, Dennis. I don't want anything. It's not about me and you. It's about our kids. I said, hi, great. What's wrong now? What do they need? I said, they don't need anything. The only thing they need is they want, be, they want you to be in their lives. And I'm like, and, I'm, and I say in 18, 19 years, they never said that to me. It's always, you know, you know, something they want. And, I'm, and I just got so detached to that. It's more like, okay, great. What you guys want? Okay, great. And they're you not mean material bad. things. They're material things. But it's like, they're not bad kids. That's the one thing, they're not even bad kids. It's just I'm so used to hearing it, the, the, those things about, okay, can you give me this? Can you give me that from everybody? And it's hard for me to sit there and, and, and separate my kids from other people. Because so all these years I've been giving and supplying and, and, and on demand and stuff like that, I really haven't had any time to be a father or even try to be a dad or try to be anything that's significant to something that's important to me. You know, I'm always thinking like, oh, Dennis Rodman, Dennis Rodman, Dennis Rodman, okay, great. I don't think I'm the, I'm the big sh or the big cheese of, 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 of the, the honcho around the world, but it's like, I'm so used to being me. There's no one in my life that's, that's helping me out. No one's doing anything to help me or to, to, to come and love me. Just actually really just say, okay, great. Let me sit you down, Dennis. I actually like you. I actually love you. I want to be actually take care of you. I never had that. Even to this day, it's, it's difficult to really adjust and adapt to that. And she uh, told my ex-wife last night, she told her that, that she didn't want to see my jerseys or anything about me anymore. And I'm like, wow. And I, I didn't even react to it. I pretty, I pretty much looked at it where I'm so used to it. I expect that. When it was growing up, they never saw me play basketball. And all they heard was, oh, your dad's a your dad is gay, your dad is this, your dad does this, he steals, he does this, he went to jail, he does this. That's all they heard about me when he was growing up, even though I was one of the most famous person on the planet. <laughs> so they never heard about the good stuff about me. It's all the bad stuff about me, which wasn't even bad. And, and it's like, it got to the point that they didn't want to go to school anymore and all that crap. And, like, and I try to tell them, you know, it's all, you know, it's my business, it's my job. But uh, they actually kind of shot away from that 
for me with that because they knew they hurt them more than anything because of what I was doing, just going to dress them in drag, um, doing makeup, wearing wigs and stuff like that. They didn't like me doing that stuff, but it's like, that was my character for me. I was doing it for me. And Did you like that, you? I like that. I, mean, I, just, like, I just like being independent and free. You know, I, I think when I, I think when I went to San Antonio, I think they gave me a lot of opportunities. And a lot of people go see this documentary. I mean, at a young age, I was doing it at a young age. My sisters was make, putting makeup on me, putting wigs on me, and dressed me as a woman and stuff like that. And pretty much, I was all like so comfortable being like that because I, I was so surrounded by that with, with women, with girls, and this. Uh, it was never with boys, and young men. It was never no, no guys at all. It's always with girls. And for a time, I thought I was. Um, for a time, I thought I was gay, you know, because I. There was no sex involved, there was no interest in girls. It was more like what girls did, I like to do with them. And when guys come around, I shy away from guys and just trying to distance myself from other guys. I just want to be around girls. And uh, it just, it, it, it was, I never just, I thought that was just normal for a guy to just hang out with the girls all the time. And it I can be. I didn't ever know it was, you know, that you know, there was gay people in the world back there in the projects, never knew that. <laughs> so I would just, uh, I thought everyone was equal to me. So I look back on your life. Um, you were homeless for a little while. Your oh, mom yeah. said, "Get a job or you're out." Right. Um, What's it like to be homeless in Dallas? And I'm assuming you were homeless two blocks from where you lived, right? Oh yeah. That's so what funny. was that like? That was funny. Funny? I mean, it's, <laughs> it was funny the fact that she kicked me out. She kicked me out and um, told me not to never come back. She changed the locks, she did all this, she did all that. So I had like a, a garbage bag full of whatever I had. I left the house and I just sat on the, um, the steps down, down the, uh, the apartment complex and didn't know where to go. So basically I just went up to my friend's house. He said, you can stay in the, in the backyard on the couch. And I said, that's cool. Outside? Outside on the couch. I said, that's cool, great, you know, so they didn't have enough beds in the house without a, a sleep on the floor, so it was a couch, so I just slept there a lot. And every day when I wake up, I go to a car wash, try to make some, make some extra money, just have money in my pocket, or I go to 7-Eleven, try to, you know, fold boxes or throw bottles away and stuff like that, just five bucks a day. And and I just felt like that it was like more like, I didn't even think of that thing as it's, it's it's an abandonment. I didn't even think it like that. I just think, okay, great. You know, I'm so used to living this life this way, so why not? This, 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 nothing, this, nothing different by living in an apartment or living in the street. Really? But, but, uh, but it's funny how, it's funny how you think like that when you live like that. It's funny how you think those ways when you live like that and it's, it doesn't really bother you. Survival, right? It's, a, it's survival mode and stuff like that. So basically, every day I sleep, I slept outside on the couch, or I go to another friend's house and sleep in, in, in with three people in the bed, or uh, they have shoes to wear. They I had to borrow shoes, I had to borrow socks, clothes and stuff like that. It just, it was just, it was just a mess. I mean, it was just one of those things where that it, it's so funny the fact that I was happy. <laughs> I was happy living like that because I was with my friends. And my friends, we hang out and play basketball every day, and I was just happy. I wasn't, I wasn't sad. I, I never cried about not going home. I never cried about my sister, not my, my mother, so-called father, any one of my relatives I never knew about. I never cried about anybody in my, in my, in my circle, just the people around me, <clears throat> that the, my friends and people that I knew. I was so happy being around them just because I had a place to go. But you're, this whole time you're growing, right? So the whole time, yeah, the whole time I'm on, on the streets, I'm growing, completely growing. I was like five foot seven, five foot eight, maybe five foot six at the time. I just started growing, just being in the streets and stuff like that. And, and it was amazing when I got to six, six, eight, or six, six, or six, seven. It was amazing that uh, I started to pick up the game of basketball. I started to pick the game up. I used to love football. And I picked up the game of basketball. And I just went to the gym every day, every day, every day. I mean, eight, nine hours, 10 hours a day because that's the only outlet I had as far as living in the streets. And uh, I would go there every day. And then all of a sudden, I became pretty good. And 
I started playing this summer league team in Dallas. This a league team around the, the whole year league, league team. Outside? Was this outside? Outside. Yeah. And and a guy asked me to play on this uh, this summer league team one summer. He said, Dennis, I like you come play for my team. You know, I said, oh, great, great. It was like a, it was like literally like NBA players, but I didn't know about was playing. And Spud Boy was in there, Larry Johnson, all these guys. I mean, uh, Carl Malone, all those guys are playing in these summer leagues, but they weren't in college. They was in college at the time, and I was just just coming out of high school at 20 years old. I was like living on the streets. These guys from Louisiana Tech, and you know, UNLV. These guys coming out playing, so I was playing like, the same team with the, they was playing on. Crazy. So, and, uh, and they're probably going, who the heck is this, this kid? This guy, right? So <laughs> this, who is this kid going down the court, wanting and screaming, putting his hand up in there, dunking, doing this stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, so I was just like the outcast because all these guys were like stars in the high schools. You know, all these guys in college, they're doing great. Uh, here, here come a guy that's off the street coming in and having a good time, just, just, you know, just loving life to the fullest. And uh, so we, uh, so I played, I played the rec for two years and one day this coach from uh, Southeast Oklahoma State came up no matter of fact I played in summer league then I went to play in a tournament it was like a mile away from my mother's house and I played in this, that game I won the MVP and a trophy about this big about this big right here it was like half probably the biggest me and when I left the gym I had nowhere to go so basically I went outside I sat on the curb with this trophy and I had a bag with me and I'm sitting there just figuring which, which direction I'm going to go, who am I going to stay with tonight, where am I going to eat at today. And um, so I looked to my left, this is my left, and there was a woman and a man walking towards me. I didn't know who it was, but I wasn't really paying attention. And all of a sudden, this, this woman puts a, a card in my face, and I looked up, it was my mother, and I didn't really like, jump up on anything. I just pretty much got the card, and she said, happy birthday. That's pretty much what's all she said, and she just walked away. And she left the card in my hand. I, I opened it, and she gave me 20 bucks. She said, even though that you live in the streets, I still love you. If you want to come back home, you can come back home, but you have to get a job. And I said, okay, great. And that's some arenas and stuff like that. And I'm looking at her as she's walking away with this guy, just looking at her. And I'm like, you know, debating, you know. And I just gave in. I said, okay, great. I have no place to go. Why not go back and revisit like, what I used to have and whatever, has anything changed? So I go back there, move back in, and all of a sudden, the same scenario at 20 years old. Well, you're not working. <clears throat> you have to move out. I'm like, all right, great. And I'm fighting that. I'm like, well, it's no jobs available. She said, well, go find one. So two days, I, Two days after I was living in the house and she was about to kick me out again, there was a knock on the door. The knock on the door and it's, uh, I answered the door and two white guys at the, um, in the doorway, they asked, is Dennis Rodman here? I said, that's me. He said, hi, we have Lon Reisman and Jack Hayden. We'd like to invite you to a university to try, try you out for a scholarship. And I'm, I'm thinking this is a joke too. I said, this is bullshit. This is whatever. I'm not doing this. So I said, okay, so I go get dressed. He said, we'll, we'll take you up there. We'll bring you right back. So I go up there with these guys and go up there and work out with these, these two guys. And they said, you know, you're pretty good. I said, well, I don't know. I just play break ball down the street. He said, oh, you like to come play for us? I said, I don't care, whatever. You know, being in a project, that's where you talk. You know, you don't give a damn about anything. And I said, okay, yeah, I tried. I said, okay, great. So we go. So I go into this office, sign a contract in tent, three year letter, three year scholarship. So I didn't know what that that mean. <laughs> I didn't know what the hell that mean. Three year scholarship. What is that? <laughs> and I said, it's okay, great. So okay, great. You'll be here for three years. You get room and board. You get a dorm room. Okay, da da da. da. I get ready. So, so I go back the next day on the Greyhound bus, and. Um, I said, hey, I got a three-year scholarship. My sister, that's awesome, that's great. And stuff like that. They was playing ball and at, a, at the high school, and they was All-Americans, won state championships four years in a row. And said, that's cool, take it, take it, take it, go, go, go. And I'm sitting there packing whatever I had, 
the clothes I had was that didn't fit. So I had to take whatever I had in a, in a tra trash bag, roll it up, and toss it on my back, and, did, and say, I'm, I'm not never, I, the one thing I said before I left, I said, I'm, I'm not coming back here unless I make something on myself. And I, even then, I didn't know what I was saying, what I was doing. Because, you know, living in a project, you see so much, so much bad, you never see anything good. You know, I go back to Oklahoma, go do my thing, and all of a sudden, I'm a, I'm a all america first year, all america second year, all america third year. And I remember when I, when I made an All-America team um, in my sophomore year, and people were saying, oh my God, congratulations, Dennis, congratulations. Oh my God, you made All-America. We never had an All-America here in like 50 years. Okay, and I'm asking someone to me, I said, to, uh, on, my, on my left ear, I said, what's an All-American? I didn't know what the hell an All-American was. What's an All-American? I said, I agree. He said, you're a good player around the world. I mean, around, around the United States. I agree. Didn't know anything about All-American. So uh, my junior year, I'm All-American again, 26, 27, and 16. 28 points and 15, 16 rebounds. I'm all America three years in a row. So basically, I'm like, I'm doing something good. Yeah. But uh, it, it was just it was a t at a time when things wasn't correct like they are today. So, and I understand that because I lived it in the 60s. Right. So I lived in the 60s. I saw all that, but I never took that as a negative for me to to keep moving forward. I yeah. You know, they want to shoot me. They want to do this. They want to damn me. Stuff like that. I never took it to heart. And uh, so basically, I, those years in Southeast Oklahoma just propelled me pretty much to leap into the NBA, you know, with, with a blindfold on, pretty much. I love to work. I love to have a good time. I love to just play basketball. But when I went to the NBA, it was different because I was so green behind the ears. I'm just, my eyes are wide open like a deer. Forget the car, forget the truck, just keep going. And more like, I just wanted to play, 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 jump, 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 the rah, rah, rah. And that was all I wanted to do. So like the whole Detroit thing explodes. Your career explodes. The, you, know, you win championships. It, it, did it happen too fast almost or? No, I think, I think what really explodes for me in, in Detroit is like, I was there, I, I, I was immature mentally wise, but I was mature enough to play the game of basketball. I had the energy and the desire and the love and, and, and the heart to play basketball, and people loved that. And they, I think people saw that in Detroit that I was just out there like, yes, you know, I want to play basketball. And I think what changed my whole life is the fact that Isaiah Thomas came to me one day. We played a game in LA at the Forum, and I was at half court, just bending down, and Isaiah uh, pulled me up and said, and hit me in the chest so damn hard. He said, you know, Dennis, this is not a game. This is not a joke. We want to win championship. You got to get your act together, get your ass together, and, and get your head focused. You can't keep going out with John Sally. You can't do this all the damn time. You got to do this. You got to do your job. We want to win. And I think that right there changed my whole perspective on the NBA because I never knew anything about the NBA lifestyle. I just thought it was just, just like a one big playground. And uh, so that, right, that, that opportunity right there, when he did that to me, Changed my whole life about the, the game of basketball. So you play with Michael. Oh yeah. And in the film, and I think you're right. You said there was a time when you were probably more famous than Michael. That's really saying something. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I haven't seen that part, but I think that when Michael see that little clip right there, I think Michael gonna get a laugh out of that. He'll say, "He's probably right." <laughs> he's gonna say, "He's probably right," because that one year in Chicago, he was. He was blowing up and stuff like that. Everybody knew me, but they, they didn't know this other guy that, that can have basketball and entertainment at the same time and right. on the nutshell. I was like, wow. But I think that I was more, I think I was, I was, a, I was a good fit for Chicago. Michael approved it, Scotty approved it, Chuck, I mean, uh, Chuck Daly. Phil Jackson approved it. Uh, I think that Michael embraced me with open arms, Scotty. So, but I said that comment, the fact that I, Every time I ride downtown, and I was, uh, I'd be listening to the radio, <clears throat> and when I get to a certain section in downtown on the 94, they'll, they'll, they'll get a traffic report. The traffic report, and uh, they said when you get to 94 and Arden, it's gonna be a delay there because uh, there's Dennis Robin billboard right there on the exit, and people are stopping by and taking pictures. And I looked at the radio, I said, what? So. I like, really? They, they kept saying it over and over. I said, oh, great. So I'm driving down when I 
down the highway, 94, and it's a traffic jam. So I, I go to the to the UV lane, and next thing you know, I'm like, and people are outside their cars on the freeway taking pictures of my face with green hair. And I didn't know that sign existed, because I passed by it every day. And I'm like, that's me. It's like, that's, and the people outside, out their cars, on the rails, taking pictures of this, this, of me. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. And it was like, before that, that my picture was there, it was Michael and Scotty. And then when I got there, it was Michael, Scotty, and Dennis. And then a couple of months, it became just me. And I'm like, wow, man, you know, I didn't even think of the time that it was like, hey, you bigger than Michael, huh? <laughs> you bigger than Michael? I said, in Chicago. I said, well, you know, that one year I was. I mean, that one year, maybe six months I was bigger. But other than that, no, it was more like I didn't take it that way. But I, I, I said it. Yes, I did. I was bigger than Michael for a minute. All right, Dennis, thank you. 30 for 30. All right, 30 for 30. So Better for worse. <clears throat> better. That's a good title, right? Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.